Welcome everybody to tonight's webinar. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the lands and waterways from which we are all zooming in from today. We recognise their diversity, resilience and the ongoing place that First Peace pulls hold in our communities. We pay our respects to the elders both past and present and I wish to extend and respect to any First Nations people connecting today. We commit to working together in the spirit of mutual understanding, respect and reconciliation. We support self-determination for First Nations people and organisations and we'll work together on closing the gap. My name is Helene and alongside me is Jade. We are the Workforce Development Officers at PHN and I'd like to welcome you all to our cardiology webinar, CT Calcium Score and CT Coronary Angiogram. Just a couple of little housekeeping things tonight. The majority of our webinars are recorded and freely available on our YouTube channel. You can see that up on the um, screen at the moment. We also have a practice communique that we send out fortnightly with really good in information, including an internal and external calendar. We also, you can also subscribe to our West Vic fortnightly newsletter via the website. Please make note of the PHN health pathway relating to this topic that is on the screen at the moment. Now for this evening's meeting, may I ask participants to remain on mute for the course and should you have any questions, just type them in the question box and I'll answer those on your behalf during the course of the meeting. They will all be answered anonymously, so just type them in and we'll um, get them answered for you. Our speaker for this evening is Dr. Araf Arjamand, who is a cardiologist. I would like to welcome Araf and I will now hand over to him. Thanks, Araf. Thank you very much. Thanks for the nice intro. I hope you can all see my slides all right. Mm. Yes, we can. Good. Now, I'd, uh, my name is Arif. I'm made in Germany, so to speak, therefore the German accent. And a bit about myself. This is where I grew up, somewhere in Germany. Went to Magdeburg to study, which uh, where they invented the or found the vacuum pump. Went on to study in Berlin, um, and then traveled to Melbourne to do some further specialization. WA for seven years for further specialization, and then uh, back to Hamburg. And and this is what we did there at times. Usually when you tried to go home. Um, and this is ECMO, which is equ ex extra corporal um, membrane oxygenation. When people just jog after work and drop that, that was a 50 year old where we had to do this. And you wonder why I'm showing this, but obviously this is one part of the coin that we do and deal with every day. But really, we don't want to get to that situation where people need to be resuscitated, right? And therefore, um, I would like to talk about the role of CT coronary angiography and the calcium score in day-to-day -day practice and possibly in more acute situations as well. You know, some may wonder, will I still be able to eat my weekly Zufaki or kebab after this? And is there any other test or is that better than the others? There are plenty of tests, of course, but uh, this is a CT talk and I deem this to be one of the better test sometimes in um, combination with the functional test just a simple exercise stress test why would i image or why would we want to image and what are the objectives to obviously stratify um, the cardiac risk of a person that's mainly asymptomatic with a calcium score uh, with one or two risk factors or symptomatic patients with and without the traditional cardiovascular risk factors in order to prevent an immediate or threatening event that in the future that may never occur that we'd like to prevent though. Now, we would like to recognize subclinical coronary artery disease, which we would otherwise not be able to visualize if we don't do an angiogram, a conventional angiogram, and we would like to prevent morbidity and mortality. And we would guide, like to guide medical and interventional therapy. By medical therapy, we get to that a little bit later, aspirin and statin therapy and blood pressure management. 
the features that I use almost daily is the calcium score that's mainly used by my GPs already quite wisely and the coronary uh, CT angiogram which um, is currently still needed to be used by a, by a specialist otherwise if there's no rebate to it um, and now what we want to do is we want to identify high-risk asymptomatic individuals. You may think that that's the main reason why we like to use calcium scores. As a matter of fact, if we use the calcium score in almost 63% of um, patients, we actually downgrade them from a previously thought higher risk to a lower risk, meaning they can come off tablets that they don't need to be on. Um, but when once we find coronary artery calcium, we know that that is a highly specific marker of atherosclerosis. Um, and it is a surrogate marker of um, burden of atherosclerosis that independently predicts um, risk and mortality. Stroke and cardiac events, that is. So this is a bit of a confusing slide because what we're really getting is asymptomatic patients with risk factors, symptomatic patients with risk factors, symptomatic patients without risk factors, and asymptomatic patients without risk factors. You might just say, scan them all. And that's what I pretty much do, but I am quite biased when I see my patients, obviously. Now, Obviously, chronic angina is a common presentation and that may be the reason why you would refer a patient to a cardiologist. However, in 50% of patients, they present for the first time with AMI or even sudden cardiac death. So we do like to use this tool, CT, calcium score, CTCA, to improve the outcome non-invasively. And the emphasis is on non-invasively and visual, visualize something that we would otherwise not see with nuclear med tests, stress echoes, cardiac MRI, probably not so good. You know, the, the chronology of things would be that we have soft plaque formation, which we cannot image with the calcium score. I'll get to that a little later. Then an elevated calcium score and a hard plaque formation, and then later leading into obstructive coronary artery disease and uh, mixed plaque with high risk plaque formation and hopefully not an acute myocardial infarction. Um, now a picture says more than a thousand words sometimes. So if I sit down with my patients, almost everybody is interested in seeing these pictures that we um, have requested. And to the left, you can uh, see that the um, aortic valve and off the aortic valve comes the LAD and the diagonal one, and uh, there's clearly no calcium because calcium is as white as the sternum or the spinal column, the vertebra here. Whereas here on the right-hand side, you can see these streaks of calcium. And this is just a calcium score. You cannot make any judgment over if there's any luminal obstruction, but it's certainly um, a lot of it, which translates into a higher cardiovascular risk, morbidity and mortality. Now, then again, you may have seen these uh, tables that are followed, um, that are attached to the reports. And, and these, these scores and the risk of myocardial infarction and stroke at 10 years is coming from huge cohorts following soldiers over 20 years. And we know that when people with high cholesterol but a calcium score of zero, um, they have a very low risk at 10 years. I don't usually leave it for 10 years to recheck the calcium score, but we know that it's safe to do so, meaning to withhold aspirin and statin therapy. Once it comes to 100, 1 to 100, it's less than 10%. 100, 1 to 400 calcium score is moderate risk. This is where we start aspirin and statin ter therapy for sure, amongst other risk factors, of course. And you can see the numbers for the other ones. That there is no open end. We see calcium scores of 1,000, 2,000 and above. Um, but quite frequently, we also see a zero. 
um, calcium. This is what we're probably dealing most of the time with in this cohort, you know. So it's important to know that once the calcium score is higher than 1000, you shouldn't continue to do a CT coronary angiography because you can't see anything because it's all white, just white. Get to that a little later. Now, um, have that already. Next here. So who should undergo calcium score? This could be a complicated slide, but we're looking at, I wouldn't be so strict with the age 45 to 75, but that's the recommended age group. Mainly the, the left-hand side, the asymptomatic ones with the framing hang risk equation, if we combine that. And then we have the low risk and the intermediate risk group. These are the ones that are benefiting the most from the calcium score only um, in terms of downgrading them and leaving them there. Um, however, if they're high risk already, they're unsuitable for a calcium score. And sometimes we move straight to a direct um, invasive angiography. Now, again, these pictures, I'm sorry that they cut off on top, but it doesn't really matter. It's all about calcium score zero, calcium score one to 100, and over 100. Now, what that really um, means is what's the number needed to treat for a statin in order to prevent one event, right? So if you have a calcium score of zero, you see that you need 549 patients to give statin to, to prevent one event. That's a lot, we don't do that. That's not economic and the side effect of the statin may exceed the benefit. So um, once you move to one to 100, the number is only 94. And you may actually add in aspirin depending on where the plaque sits in the proximal NAD. You may think a little different. Sorry, I'm on call. Um, and when you move on to the calcium score of over 100, you are definitely in a statin and aspirin dose um, area because you only need 24 patients to give statin to in order to prevent one event. There are studies out there that suggest the number is as low as 12 but uh, the truth is somewhere in the middle, I suppose. So with aspirin, the number is a lot higher. If you add um, 100 calcium score, it's 173. If you adjust that with this, what we call the Framingham risk score, and that's high, the number drops down by 50%. So, so you're in a, in a range where, um, that's just a summary of what I just said. So statin and aspirin, guided. That's what the calcium score really does for us. Um, so where, where has this calcium score no benefit? So when you have an asymptomatic patient, but he's a high risk patient, you use a calcium score, but the patient is still in a high risk group. Let's say positive family history, they all have premature coronary artery disease and the calcium score comes back um, um, lowish or zero even, then you still have the patient, you haven't downgraded him, right? Where if you have the patient asymptomatic and in a low risk group, it's still low after a low score. That's why the best patient to scan is the intermediate, asymptomatic um, intermediate patient. So scan all of them. It may sound complicated and it is a bit, at the end of the day, you can't go wrong by scanning more than you don't scare because the irradiation is little and the benefit is high. So use your clinical acumen. You can use this risk equation. I would hardly ever do it, only if I want to impress patients with the equation, if they really want to know. You mix that with a calcium score and then you can actually downgrade patients that are thought to be high risk by 25%. Now, moving on to the CT coronary angiography, um, that's it. in the meantime has found its way as a class one recommendation in uh, diagnosing coronary artery disease in symptomatic patients. Um, because the pictures are just great. It has very good sensitivity, meaning it can rule it out CAD very well compared to the other modalities and has a modest specificity. Um, 
when we see these stenosis, we get to the pictures, then we have to overcall the stenosis very often as it appears combined with calcium, especially when the calcium score in the weight of the patient is quite high. Um, who is not ideal? As I said, whoever has a lot of calcium, then all the vessels just light up in white and you cannot actually make a good judgment about the lumen um, or an inability to tolerate heart rate lowering medications. Everybody needs to be um, ideally with a resting heart rate of 60 when they're in the scanner to allow good picture quality and so therefore we give beta blockers usually 50 milligrams the night before of metropolor and 50 milligrams on the morning of. That's in our center. Other centers may be different. If somebody has impaired renal function and you don't want to put extra contrast on top and if someone's really concerned about radiation exposure. However, the radiation is very low, um, as low as 0.1 a millisievert, especially with the newer scanners. I do have a couple now, of questions, we see, we see... Arif. Yep. Uh, first yep. question, I'm interested to hear about the addition of aspirin. There is no aspirin in the current CVD guidelines. What have I missed? The addition of aspirin. So as soon as we know, well, I've just, I'm going to go back to this slide. It, aspirin is a mainstay of still primary prevention. Um, uh, some people have come to me and said the aspirin has been stopped based on a study that shows that aspirin should be re um, not used as excessive as we used it in the past. As soon as we have document subclinical atherosclerosis though, then there is this role for aspirin. As soon as we go back to a calcium score of above 100, it's gonna be very difficult to not give your patient aspirin for platelet inhibition. We see, what we see in these vessels sometimes, when we do a CT coronary angiography, we see, um, here we go. We see um, we see all sorts of plaque. We see all sorts of mixed plaque, soft plaque, hard plaque, and we know that aspirin there on top of the on top of the statin, especially in above 100 calcium score, is preventing future events. So it has never left the guidelines, the CBD guidelines, as such. I'm not sure that that answers your question. Is there a um, way we can course, like, talk to each other here or not really? Uh, uh, if, she re if I get a response back, uh, it's a bit helpful, thanks, she said. I do okay. have a couple of other questions. Do you want me to ask them now or would you like me to just lead them till the end? It's okay if I can go through them now, if that's okay. what you think is helpful. How does lipid studies feed into the choice of whether to use a statin in relation to calcium scores? Um, quite a bit. So, the tar I would still use the common targets, the national targets, um, to aim for an LDL of 1.8 and below. That's when we know that we have achieved our treating to target, just like we want a blood pressure of 130 over 80 in that cohort. We want an LDL of 1.8, but very often the LDL measurement is not an exact measure, but it's the only um, measurement we have available in order to see that our patients are actually taking um, their tablets as such. You know, a lot, of, a lot can be achieved with guidelines, uh, with just lifestyle, and, um, but the actual plaque modification, for instance, if you have a plaque like this, calcified or uh, this sort of mixed plaque or this sort of plaque or this sort of plaque which is a high risk plaque then you really would want to be the LDL to be as low as possible and sometimes the pathology labs suggest something below 2.5 but when you have a high risk plaque morphology you want to 
achieve an LDL of 1.8 and below. Is that helpful? Yes, thank you. And just one more question before you move on. Why is calcium scoring of no value in risk stratification in high-risk patients who are static? Surely a low calcium score should still be reassuring. Um, yes. Now, if I, you probably, that's right, I use it a lot. It's not recommended though. And the reason being is I might have to fast forward here if I answer your question straight away. Am I going backwards? Sorry. Uh, it's mainly because we miss we miss these um, we miss these soft plaques. Now I'm going to just show you a good example of a patient. So this is a typical. Um, calcium score that comes back to you, 181, somewhere in this category, moderate, you go, yes, fine, aspirin and um, statin, and um, the patient is asymptomatic, so you're all happy with everything else. This patient here, however, oh, sorry, that's already, this patient here, however, um, this patient has had not my patient has had not my patient initially um, has had symptoms and had a calcium score requested in the outpatient setting that calcium score came back as zero right so you you think but it was a high risk patient with high risk features positive family history two patients uh, two family members with sudden cardiac death before the age of 55 she was diabetic hypertensive and had a high cholesterol However, this is what we saw, right? Calcium score zero. So you would tend to think that's all I need to do. I'm not going to move on any further. But she didn't have a CT angiography. Now, what what that um, what that showed later, the CTA which I've added was that you could see literally no calcium. You could see this, these are the pictures that we get. They're quite nice. Um, homogeneous flow of filling of the artery with no calcium at all, but high grade stenosis here. And that's the soft plaque that we talk about. So if you rely on the calcium score in a high risk patient, you will miss these patients. And if you, if you think a high risk patient has um, coronary artery disease, it's best to possibly move on to an angiogram, but you're right. If you combine this with a CT coronary angiography, and that's the real message of, of your question would be to combine, to do a CTCA, because then you would not miss this one. So a calcium score alone misses this. The calcium score does not pick up on the, on the um, plaque, on the, on the heart plaque. This is what we saw on the angiogram, a huge tandem stenosis which I then fixed and it looks after like something like this afterwards and she was okay. Now, was there a next question? And did that answer the question? That's an important message of the talk though. It's important that you understand that or that that's a good take home message, so to speak. Just in regard Hello? to that question. Yeah. yeah, just in regard to that question before, the answer came back. So you were more interested in LDL than in the HDL dot LDL. Absolutely. We used to we used to we used to say that in the past, if the HDL is high, we can sort of be a little bit more lenient uh, on the target goal achievement. That's I don't do that in my practice. I'm quite aggressive to get the LDL to 1.8 and below in the setting of um, documented coronary artery disease. May it be subclinical or symptomatic? Yeah. Thanks, Araf, and um, yes, that answered the last question. Thank you. Okay. Continue. Now. Okay. I think in future I may not answer the question as I go along. It's okay though, it keeps me on my toes. Now, um, hang on, where was I? So, so this is where we were um, stuck. 
last before I move on. So this is what we quite frequently see. And if you if you see these pictures, um, you do need to treat these calcium flex or calcium mixed with soft plaque, right? The soft plaque we miss completely, which is the real stenosis, and the, the calcium is just a superimposed, um, superimposed disease, so to speak, which from which actually no acute danger arises. We know the soft plaque is the real problem, but the calcium score acts as a bystander and surrogate marker. Yeah, um, and we do see all forms of se severities, obviously. We do see occlusions as well. We pick up on all these things without putting a catheter into them. So there's obviously a role for uh, CTCA and patients who underwent CTCA were 40% more likely to be prescribed aspirin or statin and or statin um, compared with patients undergoing the usual care. In addition, you could say that the reverse as well. You know, when, um, once the CTCA comes back clear, not so much the calcium score, um, the CTCA, then you confidently can say and leave them alone for five years, at least, at least. So we went through this, 181, that's the, the disease we found on the, in the LAD, calcified soft plaque, doesn't pick, get picked up by the calcium score, but by the CT coronary angiography. Calcium again, soft plaque, high grade stenosis. Um, that's real life here where the angiogram are performed. And then um, that's after the stent. Uh, we went through this example, which is really, you know, does not get picked up the calcium, obviously, because there is no calcium, but there is soft plaque in a patient with high risk. Yeah? They're out there in the community and pre and post the stent. Now, um, obviously, what else do we pick up when we send patients for CT? It's not always wanted, but we find other things like lung cancer detection. That's already part of the workup. Um, now, this is what we do a lot these days. Just wanna go through a few slides again, just to tell you Um, that here we go. I don't know if you can see the slide all right, but uh, there's a population based. That's the Meta atherosclerosis study, 10 year outcomes by uh, Budov, who is a, a CT guru as such. And he, these are the ones with the calcium score of 300. And then Gray is 100 to 300, and you see the, the the lowest line. It has zero calcium, and we followed them up over 10 years. They literally have literally has close to no events, right? If they are not in a high risk group, okay. If they're not in a high risk group, once you're up in a higher calcium score, you're not in a low risk group anymore. Um, this just shows that if you have a calcium score of zero and you treat them statin versus no statin in low risk patients, these are two lines, a blue and a red line, and they're congruent they're on top of each other. There is no difference after 10 years, right? So you can confidently leave these low risk patients with a calcium score of zero alone you don't necessarily need to chase their uh, cholesterol um, practice is sometimes different clinical practice um, with a calcium score of 1 to 100 you have um, again statin versus no statin you see the curves um, diverging a little bit already after 10 years worthwhile enough to consider a statin Obviously, and here you can see, you start seeing the biggest difference in a calcium score of 100 to 400. Quite dramatically, same here in higher scores. Let's see. And in this, in this um, 
in this group, that's a different study. You rem remember, it was 24 in the picture I've showed you earlier. This is the one we, we talked about. Um, it's the number needed to treat for calcium score of over 100. So only 12, you only need 12 patients um, in order to prevent one cardiovascular event or a stroke. I think that's quite impressive. Mm. CTCA has shown to prevent hospital admission and stay as well. And this is just a uh, um, an example of how it compares to other uh, modalities. So if you use a PET scan or a stress echo or a conventional exercise stress test or cardiac MR, which is not widely available, the rate of non-invasive functional testing prior to a conventional angiography, it's, it's, it's like flipping a coin. Whereas when you have a CT coronary angiography, you pick up the disease. And if you then wonder whether or not it is uh, symptomatic, you can combine that with a functional, with an exercise stress test and push the patient. That's what I do quite regularly. I push them above the 80% of the predicted heart rate. Um, that just um, supports this, that what I've just said. And um, yeah, so I think I think there is there, it's not it's not questionable at all if CT coronary angiography is playing a role. It is more why haven't they had one yet in order to exclude or uh, exclude significant disease and keep them off medication or to aggressively treat them at an early um, time in their life in order to prevent disease. And um, that's all I have to say. There's a lot more out there, but I, I think I'd like to conclude, to be honest. Have I got more questions, please? Yes, I do have a question. When and how often should the calcium score be repeated in low risk, moderate risk and high risk patients every 10 years? Uh, and then it's question mark, every 10 years, question mark. No, every five years, five years. The studies have suggested that 10 years is safe, right? But if you have someone with a low calcium score of, or zero, then I routinely repeat it in five years, okay? If you have someone with an elevated calcium score, they, they need to be treated aggressively anyway with aspirin and statin and blood pressure medication and a good glycemic, glycemic control, right? Um, so you don't really need to then uh, repeat it all that much because it only has academical value because you're treating the patient once they had their baseline already very aggressively and you treat the targets rather than a picture after you've obtained the picture. Um, so it's routinely recommended when the calcium score is zero or in the zero to 100 range. That's where we think it's most beneficial to repeat it. Yeah. Thank you. Um... Is there any real difference between imaging companies, i.e., do you see better results slash more accurate with some of the more reputable imaging companies versus a lower cost one? Um, I can only, I don't think I'm the right person to answer that question, to be honest. I have seen four different scanners and picture qualities. It comes down to the slices, the amount of slices the, the scanner has, you know. Um, in Australia is fortunately quite progressed. Um, I had my scan done in, in Berlin, in Germany, not too long ago. And to my, to my surprise, they only had 64 um, centimeters or 64 slides. Whereas here, most, in most places we have 256 slides which brings the radiation down and the image resolution up amongst other advantages. So um, I think we're in a safe place here when it comes to um, CTCAs, to be honest. 
Thank uh, you. Another... It shouldn't make much. I'm not sure that I've answered the question in the way that you wanted me to answer it, though. Thank you. Uh, next question: Why does soft plaque cause occlusive disease only in high-risk patients? In other patients, soft plaque progresses to calcified plaque before becoming occlusive. Well, that's that's a simplified. Yeah, I'm, I apologise if my if my simplified slide may have suggested that soft plaque can flick off any time in in so if once you have soft plaque you're in a high risk group and soft plaque is as we think the plaque for all we know at this day and age the one that is causing acute myocardial infarction the calcified plaque is so somewhat stable outside the vessel wall inside the vessel wall and does not immediately flick off but um, over time can cause more calcified occlusion and that's the patient that presents more with worsening angina right whereas the soft plaque when it flicks off and occludes is the one that comes to me at three o'clock in the morning with an acute myocardial infarction um, it's hard to answer these questions without directly talking to the person again so I'm not sure if that answered the question I will let you know once they respond to me Do, yes thanks it did answer yeah. the question so thank you uh, okay. next question do you have a particular statin preference oh no, look, I think we're still suffering from the aftermath of that 60 minute show from time to time and um, where it said all the statins are basically made from hell and come from hell. I still have patients that want me to write a PhD for them why I am poisoning them with statins. So to be honest with you, I am just happy when they take their statins. And I don't really care what which one it is. I I have um, had a few patients that had almost psychosis-like um, side effects with um, Crestor, and they went better with atorvastatin. Um, I find Crestor a little bit more aggressive in achieving the LDL goals. Um, they're both atorvastatin and Crestor come as a composite with azetamibe as an add-on if you haven't achieved your goals and um, um, I sometimes suggest alternating days smaller doses reassess the situation and uh, if they really have myalgias then sometimes I use the prevastatin which um, is slightly stronger than the combination of avocados olive oil psyllium husk bioflavonoids and sardines and mackerel and all of that I, I like that as well you get them to a an acceptable level if that all of that doesn't help and they're high risk i'm going to move on to injectable cholesterol lowering medication um, which i don't have to do very often thank so, you um crestor atorvastatin pravastatin Okay. Is there a place for monitoring known CAD with regular CTCA? Absolutely not. There is no real benefit of that. Once you mm, regular, well, regular is, um, I don't usually do that. In my practice, I have a baseline and it's not recommended. You would do like the calcium score, you do that every five years. You have to imagine that if you have established coronary artery but subclinical, meaning fairly symptom free on aggressive treatment, there is nothing to be gained if you um, monitor or perform another CT after a year or after two years. Uh, once the patient develops symptoms and you know you the patient has got 
obstructive or moderate disease, I should say, then they move on to an angiogram. And very often, because of the burden of calcium on the CT coronary angiogram, as I, I don't know if you remember the slide, the CT coronary angiogram overcalls not the amount of calcification, but the amount of the stenosis. Um, we're only sort of allowed to report from zero to 25% stenosis, and from 25 to 50%, and then from 50 to 75 and 75 and upwards. So we're not actually, um, um, that's how we ought to report. And very often, more often than not probably, in the past when we used to perform diagnostic coronary angiography on patients with a higher degree stenosis, we find that we downgrade them again. Um, but we don't monitor them with regular CTCAs. Especially once you put them on statins, the, the plaque is not, the calcified plaque is, is there to stay and sometimes appears as if it's more, but it's more modified. And the, and the soft plaque is not necessarily regress, regredient as we thought in the past. Again, it's just being modified as such. So you're probably just confusing yourself and the patient with additional CTCAs, I would have thought. Okay. A bit of a lengthy, okay. bit of a lengthy answer, but it's a good question. Mm. Thank you. Uh, any more questions, please type them in. I don't have any more at the moment. Um, some great comments coming in. Thank you, excellent. That was in response to one of your answers from one of the um, attendees. Thank, thank you. Um, excellent answer, response to what to do for high-risk patient. Thank you very much. Very welcome there. I don't know so if you... You can ask, yep. you, you can always um, email me questions if you like. Um, I don't know if you have my. I have your email address. So there you go. You can just yep. email me or text me in with regards to what to do. I think the calcium score is helpful, absolutely. But very often, um, because of the rebate, the calcium score is. Um, can easily be requested in the GP country, so to speak, and the CTCA is more requested by a specialist, otherwise the patient has to pay about $550. I think the, depending on where you go, the, the calcium call costs the patient $120, maybe a bit more. Um, I usually add on a CTCA to look at the lumen. That makes sense. But it I helps for a, the GP yeah. to, in, yes, yep. I do have another question come in. If you have a patient with high cholesterol slash LDL levels, but low risk CTCA, do you still treat with a statin? Well, if you, then if you're asking me, I personally have almost a bad conscience to not treat them, right? Um, to be honest with you, I used to treat everyone regardless, quite aggressively. Then I relaxed a bit. At the moment, I'm in the state where I'm individualizing my sort of therapy. Um, I do see good results, especially in my private practice with patients with lifestyle measurements. So if they fast, um, you know, intermittent fasting, lifestyle changes, exercise, not as much. Um, and then we can achieve quite good results. And if I'm happy with that in the low risk patient, I leave it there. We do see patients with just this isolated dyslipidemia and the, and the total cholesterol goes up to nine and the LDL is 5.7 or so. And then sometimes I discuss that with my patient and I say, look, I actually say, look, the numbers suggest or the study suggests that we can safely defer treatment and just um, repeat the calcium score um, because we don't know we don't have studies to suggest that if you treat that that your calcium will not build up that's we don't have that data right as soon as we as soon as we document disease then we know that we prevent further more fatal disease right but the 
the primary primary prevention data we don't have available. So I think if the patient understands that we're not treating or understands why we suggest treatment, I think if you incorporate them in your decision making, then um, and you just tell them the number needed to treat, but right? 530 patients or 550 patients you need to give one tablet to in order to prevent one event. That particular patient may say, look, I don't care. I would take that risk of that, you know, most of the time the patient that the tablet doesn't do anything. That particular patient, if they see it as an extension of their lifestyle, right? Anti-aging, you may get come across that particular patient. Then they need to know why they're taking it and what their goals are. Um, but I do have a bad conscience from time to time to not treat it, but I do that more and more. Thanks, Araf. I do not have any more questions that have come in. So could I just take this opportunity to thank you very much for taking the time out to present this evening. We're so fortunate to have such an expert in your field. Um, so really nice good comments say. that have come in. Uh, thank you to all the attendees that have um, webinared in tonight. Don't forget to complete the evaluation. If there's any more of these sort of topics that you want, pop them in the evaluation and we possibly may get a rough back again to, to talk on another topic. So Absolutely. thank you. Thank you very much, Araf, and thanks everyone for attending and we will leave it at that. Thank you very Bye, much. Everyone. I hope it was useful. Bye.